First off, I'd like to say this is the first talk my family was able to make it to. And my beautiful wife, my beautiful grandmother, my grandpa, and my great uncle, my favorite uncle, who's also my godfather. Can you please stand up? Thank you all. Now, wait, Lori. I'll do it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. I'd just like to first say that I'm happy to be alive. Because. Thank you. On uh, May 31st, 2002, I was involved in a fatal car accident, which took the life of my best friend and left me in a coma for three months. So let's go back to the day. It was a sunny spring day. It was about five o'clock in the evening, and my old high school was putting on a play called The Gong Show. I had just graduated the year before. And uh, me, I went to go pick up my friend and go see the play, and I picked him up and I was coming back through, and my dad, was on the lake where we lived, fishing with my little sister. He waved at me and I waved at him. I went on down the road about a mile and a half. Um, and to get to my old school, we had to come over two hills. And the top of the second hill, there was a church and an intersection. So it was a blind intersection. As I went through the intersection, a lady was coming from my right, driving a pickup truck at a Honda Civic. Um, and she wasn't paying attention to the road, and she ran the yield sign and struck my car directly behind the passenger seat, ejecting me and my friend over 30 feet into a nearby ditch. So here's, uh, I'll show you the exit. Yeah, there's my car. See, there's the back, and there's uh, the front. So this This is another view. <laughs> One more, that's the truck that hit me. All right, that's the truck there, this guy. I got it under control now. <coughs> All right, now. Yep, I'm done with those slides for now. Okay, you see, I was in a very bad car accident. And uh, my dad, who was fishing on Cuba Lake, um, saw all the cop cars go by. And he got a really bad feeling in his stomach, so he followed them. And he actually pulled up onto the accident scene as I was being flown away in a helicopter. They flew me to Upstate Medical Center, which is in Syracuse, New York. And they flew my friend to Strong, which is in Rochester, where he later passed away. And uh, it, my, my dad knew a worker on the scene, and they told them where they sent me. So he went home to get my little sister and my mother, and they went up to the hospital. And uh, the hospital actually told them they didn't have an 18-year-old come in. They had an unidentified man in his 40s. They thought I was in my 40s because I was so covered in mud. And it, it's funny what identified me. Um, a tattoo I had just gotten against my mother's wishes. Um, and it's what identified me in the hospital, a Starburst tattoo. So they figured out who I was. And uh, they stabilized me for about two weeks. And uh, um, so they decided to send me to rehab at St. Mary's in Rochester, New York. And, uh, but before they sent me to rehab, they had to put a feeding tube in because I couldn't eat for myself, obviously. And uh, they, they put that in wrong, though. And they sent me to rehab not knowing that. You know, the, the feeding tube didn't adhere to my stomach, so all the feedings were spilling into my peritoneal cavity, which is the area around the stomach. So I had peritonitis, I was in septic shock, and I spiked the fever so high they couldn't read it. It was over 106. 
I developed all these complications in rehab. And uh, they sent me to a nearby hospital in Greece called Park Ridge. And uh, my mom was actually not right in her, but she stayed with me for three months. She went with the ambulance. And uh, the surgeon came in to evaluate me. And uh, he came out and he told my mother, Mrs. Flynn, there's no hope. Um, what, what hope is there? You know, your son uh, doesn't have a chance of living, and if he does live, he'll be in a nursing home his whole life. So, what I can do is put him in a room, keep him comfortable, and uh, he will die, or he will pass within 24 to 48 hours. And my mom tells me she's got a feeling inside. And she told him, you know, you're not God. Do the surgery. So. <laughs> Reluctantly, he did surgery. You know, I survived, obviously. <laughs> and so he came out. Um, and he told my mom, I, uh, I made it through surgery, but more than likely, I wouldn't make it through the night. Sorry, sorry, but uh, more than likely I wouldn't make it through the night. And uh, so my mom was staying with me in the room, and she could read all the all the signs on the monitors, and she knew I was going to die really soon, like within five minutes. So she left the room, um, and but a nurse came in to say a prayer over me, and in the corner of her eye. She saw a big white figure, and it dissipated, so it went around the room, out the door, and down the hall. And down the hall, a psychiatric patient was staying, who was always screaming out, the doctors are trying to kill me, help me. They were afraid I would wake up and hear her screaming for her life. As soon as the figure went by her door, she screamed, God's here. And for no explainable reason, all my vital signs began to normal out. Um, The, the hospital, um, they, they, they decided to send me back to rehab. I was still in a coma. And I got to rehab. And uh, most people think you just wake up from a coma. You don't just wake up, it's very gradual. Um, like I said, I was in a coma for three months, so. Um, they, they sent me back to rehab. And uh, at rehab, I woke up and I couldn't walk at all. I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't talk at all. Um, and I couldn't, um, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, and I couldn't, I couldn't even swallow. I had to relearn how to swallow. I still have a problem swallowing because I have what's, um, what's called a delayed swallow from the accident. And let, me, let me show you the pictures of my accident. That was me, that was the day of my accident in Rodden, in Syracuse. That's, um, that's where they perforated my stomach with the feet too. And, uh, that's me in rehab, um, still technically in a coma. Six foot, 90 pounds. My arm was like that for three months. So they couldn't pull it straight. They had doctors try to pull it straight. They had to put a cast on me. They would pull my arm as far forward as they could, and they put a cast on. And they pulled as far forward as they could, and they put a cast on without pain medicine, which was very painful. So they sent me under her care. Um, and then I began a very long rehab process. Oh, thank you. They, they sent me home under her care, and oh, much better. Um, and I had to do about a year of outpatient therapy, very intense therapy, because I had, I couldn't I couldn't really walk or anything. And, um, I, so I began to talk again. 
and they sent me home. Um, and it's a, it's a funny story with how I began to talk. Um, a saint, and they just proclaimed her a saint. Her name is Kateri Tikawitha. My mom had a first class relic of hers, and they put that on my neck, and I spoke the same day. And uh, I guess what my first word was. My dad was on the phone with me, and he asked me to say Jesus. So I said Jesus, and he dropped the phone. So my first word was Jesus. And then uh, they, they sent me home, and I went to, I moved out of my parents' house after rehab to Rochester on my own. Um, and I was up there for about two years. I went back to college and everything. And uh, mind you, I'm, I wasn't supposed to do anything at all. I was supposed to be total care my whole life. Just, it goes to show that they're not in control. God's in control. <laughs> so I lived in Rochester for two years and I went back to college. And I did, I did very good. I had a 3.7 GPA, which I wasn't even supposed to get a 2. Again. I mean, mind you, I was only part-time taking three courses, so I don't want to take so much credit. So uh, they, they sent me, I, went, I moved back to around my family in Waterloo. And uh, I, was, I, got, I got a job. I worked at Staples for a while. And then uh, I, I started a brain injury rehab program, um, presenting on wildlife to little kids is trying to get better. I was still trying to get better, and mind you, this is six years after it happened. Everything is very slow steps. I couldn't run for the first eight years about. I play full court basketball now, so. But I started, I started a rehab program, and then I met my wife, um, this is my, who's sitting right there. And uh, there's a funny story how I met her. Um, she was actually cleaning up animal poop. <laughs> I walked in the room, and the rest is history. <laughs> I knew right then. We started dating, um, and then we got married less than a year later. Now, we have a beautiful daughter together. And, uh, we, na we named her Faith. Faith Marie Flynn. So she's Faith Flynn, so it's a good name.